Thank you so much for being on the show, Alexa. Thanks for having me. Alex, it's been um, a very busy year for both you and me. I wanted to have you uh, already last year, um, but you know you were working in DeepMind, and I was on an extended international travel. But you know, so glad to finally have you here. Um, and I'm just thinking, uh, instead of talking about your um, such a long list of accomplishments, let's start with um, not so proud moments, um, maybe, uh, which is uh, dropping out of your master's in electrical engineering. And I'm just wondering, um, how did that play out uh, for you in the long run? Yeah, thanks for for the question. Like I, I I honestly think that that's not my failure. It's probably one of my brightest moments because from that moment on, I started doing what I think I'm naturally very inclined towards, and that's like self studying and, and and creating my own curriculums and learning on my own. So uh, be, because of that, I definitely consider it like a, a, a bright spot in my career because when I was studying back then, I, I enrolled into the electronics uh, curriculum. And like the, the, as soon as you like finish the bachelor in, in Serbia in electrical engineering, it kind of becomes less competitive and like you, you get into the saturating returns. And so because of this, I think this was the best decision I could have made that led me eventually to Microsoft DeepMind and all of the other cool stuff I've done. But did you notice that you know that that can be um, a, a turn off for a lot of recruiters, or at least uh, people who are shortlisting? Do you think that that's common these days, or you know, do you, you're simply evaluated based on your merit? Yeah. So, so in my like, I mean, in the AI industry and software engineering, like with, with the best companies in the world, it's definitely not because a lot of the best people in the world don't have masters, don't have PhD. I could give an example of Chris Ola who is very famous in the machine learning community, who, 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 who dropped out of maybe even bachelors. Uh, and he, he got the, the yeah, yeah. And he got the funding from Peter Thiel's, um, uh, was it Founders Fund? To, and he went ahead to do amazing stuff. So there, there's just so many examples across both research and academia, as well as industry, even more so. Uh, because as you know, like the, the being, being a dropout in Silicon Valley is a fairly uh, common uh, pattern for for some of the most successful pattern uh, so, some of the most successful founders yeah that's very interesting actually and i thought that was only reserved for uh, the billionaires uh, like steve jobs and you know other people dropping out but i guess that's the same for software engineers and um, ml engineers as well uh, but before we actually talk about your ml um, career which is you're known for and you know your youtube um, channel talked about that um, let's talk about your humble beginnings uh, as an android developer and you know that's something you know, that that's very different from uh, what you do now uh, how did you actually get into that and you were also talking about uh, that you would didn't want to be the software engineer mm -hmm. um, in general uh, but focus more on ml engineer how did that journey come about Okay, so I was studying electronics uh, during my uh, bachelor, um, and then slowly at the end of my studies, I realized for multiple reasons that I really want to pivot more into software engineering. Some of those reasons are like more opportunities, um, more open source projects, more transparency in the field, in general, just more excitement and, and better salaries, I'm not going to lie. So like all of that combined, I decided I want to pivot. And then like that, that whole Android internship was basically me for the first time doing this self-created curriculum where I just um, went through a bunch of courses, created a couple of apps, even published some to, to Google Play Store, and then worked in Germany for three months uh, as an Android developer in a small German startup. So I think even as a, just as a life experience, I think that was like just a very, very one of the crucial moments in my career, to be honest. And back then I thought I'm, I'm kind of falling behind because everybody all of the successful peers I knew went to do internships at Google and Facebook. And I thought I'm falling behind, but like now in retrospect, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm so glad that I've done that type of internship. That was more of a life experience. I was living like with five Germans in a flat. I had to learn German as well. Uh, well, I previously already studied it, but it was, so it was easier, but like, yeah, that's a TLDR why I think it was uh, valuable at the end. Yeah, let me actually quote an, an interesting thing that you wrote in your Medium blog uh, about that period. And you said that uh, some kid who's 16 and you were 23 back then could go and do some lead code problems for nine months and he's already ahead of me And in this respect, even though he or she lacks so much of the fundamental engineering knowledge. Was it like one of the um, uh, times when you felt that, you know, uh, to getting ahead of engineers is way more easy in today's work? 
Well, I mean, definitely the, the statement I made, I still believe it's true. Uh, people who are in high school and they start competing competitively, uh, doing competitive programming, doing the algorithms and data structures, because that's kind of what the big tech are asking for. That's, that's what you're asked in the interviews. Uh, if you just hyper-focus on, on that niche area, so to speak, because it's also very broad in, in and of itself. You could, you could do a PhD and go on to have your career in, in just algorithms, as we know with Donald Knopf, et cetera. But like, it's kind of a trick and, 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 and a lot of them do miss the, 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 like a broader perspective of technology and electrical engineering. And yet they do manage to, to land amazing roles in, in big tech. Did I reply to your question? Yeah, interesting take. Yeah, it totally does. Uh, I was also wondering uh, uh, on that note, how do you rate Elite Code? Do you really think it's helpful or uh, it's kind of over um, exaggerated in some ways? Because, you know, once you have these specific uh, code, uh, coding problems, um, you can also get a false sense of uh, comfort that we're going to be talking about how you got rejected in some of those companies. Uh, and I'm sure that you have done a lot of Elite Code problems before that. Yeah. So, by the way, when you say Elite Code, I, I mostly treated as a metaphor for, for this class of, of websites that are used for uh, competitive programming. I think the, the one I was using more than lead code was back then Code Forces. I think it's like a Russian website. And that's, I think, one of the most hardcore uh, competitive programming websites. Very old school, UI is kind of very hacky, but like that's where all of the, the, the best uh, competitors are. Um, and and, um, and so, sorry, what, was, what, what exactly was your question on, 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 this, on this front? Do you find lead code really helpful or do you think it's exaggerated or just like become a fad website now for it, programmers? No, I, I mean, that's just like a playground for if, if you want to learn these skills that are asked for in the in big tech, as I mentioned a couple of times, uh, it's a great playground, pr playground, I think. It's much better than just going through a, like a thick theoretical book. Uh, it helps you understand where you stand compared to your peers. It's very interactive. You get this system of, of like, Submitting, getting the getting the immediate uh, like feedback on how good you are, and like and you can kind of go up in ranks. So because of of that, I think it's a great tool. I don't think it's a fad. I don't think it's going away. As long as algorithms and data structures are not going away, I don't think these, these websites are going to go away. That's kind of my my take on it. And I think it's fairly shared understanding among among people who yeah who do this. Nothing contrary. Do you think that? It True, but do you really think that um, it also gives you the expertise that you really need in real life coding instead of giving you a false sense of uh, um, comfort that you know you have done the lead code and now you know your job is uh, just a matter of time? Yeah, I mean it is it is a simulated environment in a way because ultimately when you start building software, there is so many more skills that are required like software design communicating with people, collaboration, knowing how to use versioning systems, having proper code readability, because you ultimately have to collaborate with other people, right? It's like all of software projects are mostly super, super collaborative. So in that sense, if you, there is a sweet point, I think. If you spend too much time doing, doing those types of uh, competitive programming um, endeavors, I think you kind of overfit, to use the machine learning terminology here, and you become less valuable in a maybe not not so intuitive way if you actually want to build some successful products and 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 and, and uh, useful projects because you you optimize you learn all of these super uh, like sh shortcuts and, and and tricks that that um, that help you in in that particular uh, niche and get to the top of the scoreboard but like it, they do not necessarily translate later on to better performance or you being better contributor to whatever you later uh, choose to, to join. And what does in your experience translate um, into better experience and, you know, smart uh, programming? A combination of all of these, like you definitely want to know, like you, you want to do this for at least a year, like one year, I think is a solid time. If you really devote yourself to this, you can learn a ton uh, in a year. And then there is a ton of other things you want to learn. As I said, reading some books on, 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 on proper software engineering practices, um, like um, building projects on your own, uh, reading papers, depending on, on where you are at your career and what you're trying to accomplish. Obviously, papers are a bit like um, later down, down the path for many people. Uh, so you, you want to have some breadth as well. Um, again, it just depends what you're optimizing for. On, depending on that question, uh, you, you should choose 
uh, backwards kind of what, how your curriculum should look like. If your goal is to become the best in competitive programming, then obviously you just want to dig down and do that and read like the, the best books on, 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 on algorithms and data structures. The one from Donald Knuth is kind of, he has, I think, a ton of books uh, <laughs> that probably no one from those people who are competing there read because it's just like very theoretical as well in nature. But I'm just saying, if you want to hyper-optimize for that outcome, then you should probably do that. Just relentlessly focus only on websites competing and reading books about algorithms and data structures. I recently read a book called uh, Cracking, the, Cracking the Coding Interview um, at Fang Companies. And I don't know if you've um, come across that. It's a wonderful book. It not only talks about the data structure and algorithm section and you know how to approach different logical questions, but also the behavioral part. And I was just wondering, in your experience, uh, is there a specific book that help you, you know, nail both sides of um, this equation? And w- what do you recommend? That's literally the most important book I've ever read. That's that's the book that actually led me. Uh, th- that was my start of the journey uh, when I started applying for Microsoft. So that happened when I was in Germany doing the the uh, before mentioned uh, Android developer uh, in- internship. Uh, the, the friend of mine who was already who was very famous here in Serbia for, for having done a lot of these internships at, at Fang companies, he just told me, "Hey, check out this book, Cracking the Coding Interview." And I was like, "Okay, let me see." And I saw the um, like the summary, and then I was like, "Okay, once I go back to Belgrade, I'm gonna start uh, just working like crazy and go through this whole book." And I did. Like I, I went through the whole initial uh, section that helps you think about the whole process from a bit broader perspective, in the sense behavioral questions and how to prepare the resume. And like everything else that, that kind of makes you a good candidate. Tips about projects, tips about how to make you stand out. And then finally, there is just a set of questions and, and, and answers and explanations. So that book is definitely one of the best books in the world for, for landing a, a job at Fang. And again, it's fairly shared understanding uh, among people who are trying to accomplish this. I always thought about that. Do you really think that that's a, a very good goal to begin with? Um, you know, to get a land a job in in Fang. Like, don't you think it's uh, rather shallow for you know someone to literally aim their whole life around one purpose of landing uh, in a company that they might not even like? Or, yeah. For you know, they don't see that you know it, it's something that they want to work, and it's just like everyone else is doing that. So. I should do that. And of yeah. course, a pay scale. It, it's a thing of prestige. So, and, and, and it's also a very individual question. Like for me personally, I always I always knew I'm not, that's not like the end goal for, for me personally. But like, it's obviously super legit that somebody does want to do that for their whole life. Like some of them do spend 10, 15 plus years working at those companies. And like, I'm, I personally, even though I'm not that person, I'm super grateful those people exist because otherwise we would not have big organizations. For big organizations to exist, you do need to have people who are staying all, like uh, around for a bit longer. But um, as, as for the question, I mean, it's a legit question. Like, is that the best thing for a young person um, that's just graduating from 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 college? Uh, is that the best destination? I don't know. Prob- definitely not for everyone. There, I think for for many people, maybe joining a, like a, as an early employee in a in a like a, a very exciting startup might be much better learning experience. Um, now the problem is how do you how do you stand out later on, um, especially if you if you if you come from, I guess uh, if you're not from the states, um, the credential part is harder to get if you just worked in a random startup X Y Z, unless that startup happened to be Mosaic ML or some of the be- Hugging Face or some of the best startups in the world while while they were just getting started, which is obviously very hard to pick because if 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 we knew how to pick that, then VC job would be so much easier. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then if you're leaning towards academia and research, then again, joining big tech, probably not the most, not the best thing in the world. Maybe you can join, um, like some research lab, I don't know, like Schmidt Huber's lab, if you're in ML or, or well, OpenAI and DeepMind, they, they are the, the best places in the world for Anthropic as well. Now, uh, Mosaic, uh, are, are some of the best places for, for, for that type of endeavors as well. Uh, so it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish with your life. Everybody has a different story, right? 
Yeah, I'm sure that at this point in your uh, career, there are a lot of people who are reaching out to you and asking about, you know, what should they do? And, you know, these are kids uh, in their early um, years who want to, you know, maybe walk in your footsteps. And I was just wondering, how do you actually go about advising these um, young people who want to you know, just land um, a good job without any concern about what they want and, you know, what they're good for? Yeah, a, a TLDR would be I just point them to my blogs. I, I really don't have that much time nowadays to, to, to reply to individual questions. And, and also the thing is, you just notice a pattern very soon. Uh, like early in my career, a couple of years ago, I already noticed that people are asking the same questions all over again. And then I just wrote what I think are very high quality blogs for people who are in that position of, of their lives. And I just point them, hey, check it out if you haven't already. And, and uh, they usually find it very, very insightful. Um, yeah. It's kind of cope. I, I, I kind of I kind of reply to the question, but by saying I, I told them to, I, I redirect them to my blogs. But the, the, the tips there are basically what I just told you before. Uh, like I try to be very open-minded and and aware that people are coming from different backgrounds, perspectives. They have different desires, and so there is no no one right path that one should pursue. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I mean, uh, all of the information that's probably out there already, it's just like uh, some people cannot find it and other people would like to, you know, hear it from right from the horse's mouth, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I really like from uh, ab about your work is that, um, and I quote it pretty often, uh, a quote by Richard Feynman, that the best way um, to learn something is by teaching. Mm -hmm. And you wrote uh, a wonderful thing in your blog about the two mods that you used for um, learning um, something uh, to its depth. And one is the input input mod in which you said that I'm ingesting information. The goal is to either get a high level understanding of the structure of the subfield, blogs, videos, or an in-depth understanding of the topic at hand. Mm -hmm. And the other is the output mod. And I'm sharing information I accumulated during my input mod, teach others, create public artifacts like YouTube videos, GitHub projects. And one of the things that I noticed uh, in my own journey, you know, YouTubing and you know, talking to people and uh, interacting with uh, others and putting out your information is that it takes a lot of courage to actually, you know, do that. And and the, and the fears kind of surround you that, you know, maybe I'm putting something stupid out there and it's yeah. going to be on the Internet forever. People are going to ridicule me and that might actually cross the table uh, in front of some of my recruiters as well. Um, so how did you overcome uh, this hurdle? And, you know, what do you think about this approach of both input and output mod? Mm -hmm. So for the latter question, um, I never had that type of fear when I'm just posting information textually online. But like YouTube was a different beast, right? Like that was for the first time in my life, I had to sit in front of a camera and speak to a camera to like some random people later on who, who are going to watch that video. So that was definitely out of the comfort zone for me. Uh, and I, I think many of my first videos, I was just like super uncomfortable, even though maybe it's not completely obvious. Maybe the first one is, but like it was not a natural thing for me as well. It's it's just one of those things. If you want to achieve something, if you if you just push yourself hard enough, I think you can you can you can do it. Unless you have some very obvious flaw, uh, which most people luckily do not have. Like I think you can just push through things and 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 make yourself better at whatever your goal is, right? Like that's the beauty of, of having general intelligence, general capability. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of um, a TLDR on, on, on that. But was it easy to actually um, teach whatever you learn? Because, you know, first time when you read something, it's not always um, easy to reproduce it uh, with your own insight if you haven't understood it um, perfectly like what's what was your first experience for example i um, saw some of your early videos um, about the uh, uh, neural style transfer um, mm -hmm. and, you know you were you were regurgitating information that you have learned um, how did you actually make sure that you were able to reproduce what you have learned yeah okay so sorry about your input output question um it's kind of already second nature for me, so I, I kind of assume everybody is doing something similar. But like the, the basic idea there is, and you, you quoted uh, Richard Feynman as well, um, you, most people, and I think um, what your regular educational institutions usually make you do is you're constantly in this input mode. And what I mean by input mode is I mean you're just ingesting other people's thoughts. You're ingesting this, this distilled knowledge that, that has been accumulated over century, especially mathematics, et cetera. You're just kind of 
absorbing that and not really giving it a thought and trying to create something creative or, or not even creative, like just trying to create something from scratch, which is a completely different beast. And there is an inher- inherent asymmetry between like evaluating, understanding something versus creating it yourself. So because of that, I'm very bullish on having these uh, output modes where um, the so-called output microcycles, how I call them in, in, in that blog, that's basically, as, as, as you just previously mentioned, trying to teach somebody else what you think you know and trying to code up something from scratch that you think you know how it works, but then the devil is in the details. You, you, tr- you start implementing and you're like, okay, I don't really understand this. I thought I understand, but now I see I don't and I see the holes. So, so I think it's a very complementary and necessary um, part of, of any learning, uh, in, in my opinion. You know, I want to take a detour here and um, talk a little bit about the origins of um, how it all started for you, even before um, the university and college. I was uh, talking to um, my good friend um, in, in the previous episode um, about uh, Julia, and he created um, the uh, data frames package in Julia for high performance computing and you know data manipulation. And mm-hmm. he was talking about um, how education was so good in Poland even before the communist times um, and during the communist times. You know that gave him the impetus um, to be mathematically mm-hmm. savvy and you know play with these problems. Now I'm just wondering how is that um, in Serbia? And you know, what was your childhood like? You know the, the school and you know the emphasis on STEM um, because I've uh, been to Slovenia. I don't know if you guys consider that Slavic or not, but um, I found the level of education was very high there and the level of food was out of the world also. I don't know if you have that in Serbia as well. There was a famous dish called Chavapčići. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Burger. We were very bullish on Chavapi here in Serbia. Um, to your question, um, the thing for me is I, for, the, for most of my grown-up life, I really despised school. And when I say, I, I, I hate, like I hated schooling, but I didn't hate, like I didn't hate education. And there is that, I think it's a, like a famous quote by Mark Twain or some, I think it, it's him where he said, like, I, I, I'm, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to try to butter it, but that's kind of the, 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 the idea. You, you want to be obsessed by education, not by schooling itself. So the, the problem is in the school, they don't teach you the fundamentals. They don't teach you the whys. And it's always very mechanic. And because of that, I was always struggling historically in high school as well. Like I really wanted to drop even out of high school. My mom was uh, convincing me, hey, don't, don't, don't drop out. Like you have to go, you have to push through this, even though it doesn't make any sense. And just to make it a bit more um, like uh, less abstract, for example, in my mathematics uh, courses, they would, what they would do is they would give you a bunch of formulas. And like, even though we call that mathematics, I, I prefer to use uh, a different word for that type of thing. I, I think it should be called digitronics or or you're being a calculator you're just basically plugging in numbers and trying to memorize formulas without understanding why is the why is the volume of a pyramid uh, b times h times over three where b is the base and then h is the the height and three is well the number uh, and so like instead of going from the first principles and trying to understand stuff fundamentally why are we just learning formulas and also, why is there no motivation behind how this was like derived and, and how we'll eventually to put it into some historical perspective and, and also into some like future perspective? Why do I need trigonometry? Like, why, why am I using something about sinusoids? And so because of all of those frustrations and, and back then, I, I was not that savvy with the Internet, so I couldn't find the best people in the world who, who could give me these, these answers, which I know now, like you can really find blogs and people giving you tips um, about all of these things. But like back then, I, I felt confused because I'm just learning some random stuff and I was super bored. And in retrospect, I think that was a very natural reaction. I think most kids who are curious and, and want to learn and passionate feel confused in, in, in school. At, like, of, of course, not everyone, but like a lot of them. And so that's kind of my, my, my take. I don't think that Serbian educational system is either bad or, 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 or good. It's probably somewhere along the world average. I, I know that like Singapore and some of those Eastern countries as well as some Northern countries like Finland, et cetera, are probably much higher up if you take a look at some of those standardized test- testings. Um, but but um, yeah, I think ultimately you have to do a lot of side um, like explorations and that, that that's where the actual fun and learning starts. So the school is, does not determine you. That's, that's kind of the, the, the summary of this longer <laughs> monologue. 
No, no, I think it's very interesting. The observation kind of uh, meets with the facts as well. For example, if you look at the U.S., um, the high school education and the math scores are horrible, you know, when you compare it with all the other countries in the in the PISA program. Um, and the highest exactly. countries are um, Singapore, South Korea, China, and then uh, Scandinavia. And I had the a privilege to actually study in Sweden. And, you know, the way that they teach math, and it's totally different. You know, they, they want to want you to solve um, realistic problems um, and, and you think out of the box, you know, create something new without any pressure about the GPAs mm-hmm. and CGPAs. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a very constructive environment. Now, I'm just wondering in your um, experience, like what is wrong with educational systems for the rest of the countries uh, hmm. that are teaching math in a very non-innovative way? For example, if you were to, you know, fix a uh, uh, Serbian education system, like what what is some some of the things that you would introduce? Yeah, uh, the ultimate problem is the incentives part. Everybody who is super good is not incentivized to remain and teach at high school, elementary school or faculties, right? I think that's the fundamental issue. Like you just have the incentives of the systems are such that it's not a prestigious role to to remain and, and, and teach elementary and high school kids. I think that's the fundamental issue, like just the, the systemic issue. And then um, there is also the inertia because government does have to, at least in Serbia, I know that's the case, um, devise a curriculum. It's very slow. It takes a lot of time for new things to propagate and, be, and become integrated, like including IT. IT like is... For many decades now, it has been a thing, right? And like in Serbia, only a couple of years ago, we started having Python tutorials. In, in And I think we are, we are kind of also at the forefront uh, in that regard compared to other countries. We you know, In elementary school, kids in Serbia are, are, are learning Python already. So that's probably a bit more advanced compared to many other countries. But uh, still, like it's a tough problem. You're trying to have a single teacher who, as I said, is probably not the best like in the world just because of the incentives. And they are trying to teach uh, 30 kids in the classroom or whatever the number is that varies across countries as well. You're trying to teach them something and you don't have any way to personalize the, 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 the learning and to adapt them to their current lifestyles and their current energy levels and, and everything else. Somebody might be hyperactive and sitting in the classroom is killing you. I was one of those kids. Like it's killing me. I, I want to have some, I want to like do some running and then do like 20, 30, 40 minutes of, of learning as opposed to just going from one classroom to another and being bored and like in a, in a, clo- in a closed space. And some kids are like super bored to do some things like that. They can just sit down and spend the whole day like just sitting and, and they, they don't need to be as, as physically active. So there's just a slew of problems why the education is is kind of broken. And like I'm very coming back to to uh, to AI. Like I, I'm I'm very passionate about the, the the latest wave of technology and and the promise of of AI assistants, which are going to be personalized for every single kid. And uh, so yeah, that's something I'm I'm really really excited about. But dwelling a little bit more on this, like where do, where do you think um, it went wrong? Because you know, I remember from my experience, I was in Romania. And I was talking to a friend's mother, and you know, she lived through this Yugoslavian era under mm-hmm. Tito, and you know, she was telling me that education was free, and it was like really good quality. Um, you know, the Russian scientists were like really famous back then, and even now, yeah. um, they're very uh, far ahead in uh, in mathematics and physics and a lot of like, these STEM fields, and that kind of translated into all the countries that were part of. Yugoslavia. And I don't know if that was in 1990s after the balkanization of these uh, countries like Serbia, Croatia, and um, Kosovo. Was it then that it all, you know, went south or was it even before that? You know, it, it I, yeah, I don't think it went south necessarily. The It's just that it, it remained the same and learning curriculums have to evolve with time, right? And so you still have, you have a legacy of this I, maybe industrial age is a bit too far away, but like like communist legacy of of and and and, and the knowledge and the way that that the people taught back then. Like since then, there, IT happened, everything happened. So so you have to to adapt, you have to change, you have to evolve, you have to to introduce new people, new DNA into the into the schooling systems. Serbia and I, I think most of these countries, and I think the rest of the world as well, um, did not evolve as as quickly as 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 the external world industry and, and, and top tier research. Who was your favorite teacher at school? Who was my favorite teacher at school? That's a good question. Elementary or high school? Why well, you got to decide that? <laughs> uh, let me think. That's a hard question. I never had to 
think too deeply about that, to be honest. Um, I, I like my, my biology uh, professor in high school because I really love biology. So that's kind of a cope answer. Um, and then physics professor was my, my teacher. She was also, she was amazing, like a great pedagogue, uh, not just like knowledgeable, uh, but also like a great, great human being. Um, my professor of physical education was amazing. He was, he's probably one of the best guys. Um, we had professional gym almost in, in the high school. It's one of the best. It's probably the, the best gym in, in high school in Belgrade, uh, like full gymnastic gym. People actually come to train there and we were lucky enough to have our regular classes there. So I, so I got to, to work out a lot and do calisthenics and stuff. So he was also a cool guy. Yeah. And the list goes on. Everybody's in, you know, in, in certain way, interesting, interesting, um, uh, human being. But my, 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 but if, yeah, if, if your like underlying question is who, who influenced me the most, I think it usually came somewhere from the world, much more than from my physical vicinity, and that thing continues to 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 present day. Like I think, just by the by, by the pure statistics, it's much more likely you'll find like a intellectually similar person or inspiring person somewhere in the world rather than in your vicinity, unless you're in San Francisco, or London, or some of those hubs where things happen. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the good things with the internet is now, now you are your <clears throat> possibility to have influence has become almost boundless. And you can have inspiration from anyone, you know, a random guy on YouTube and you find something interesting and, you know, you start talking to them and then you can learn a lot from them, which is a great thing that happens. Exactly. This is exactly why we both are. <laughs> exactly. And uh, now let's getting back to your work is that you have done so many different things. You know, you started with Android development and then you ended up in the HoloLens team. Like how did that come about? Yeah. So uh, the HoloLens team, let me, let me think that that was fairly, fairly accidental. So there is this uh, machine learning summer camp organized by Microsoft people that I was lucky enough to, to go through the qualification round and, and, and get into the, into the camp. And uh, like, the reason I said it's accidental is because I don't re recall how I found out about the summer camp. And I know it was like almost last minute. Like, I don't know, like the deadline was maybe in three days for, from, from, and, and then I, I kind of heard about it from someone. And that was probably one of the, one of those moments in life that kind of determine later your, your whole uh, trajectory. And, uh, and because of that summer camp, uh, I basically met a lot of Microsoft people there. I was, um, I obviously impressed them in, in some way or another. I was asking a lot of questions and obviously some of them were good. <laughs> Otherwise, I would never get an offer. And so in parallel, I was applying for Microsoft. And so those two combined, I went to Brazil. That was another internship that I've done. And then literally six days in, I get a call from Microsoft HR. And she's like, okay, you got an offer, uh, HoloLens team, we need you back ASAP. And I'm like, how fast do you need me? Because I just came here like half, I travel across half of the world and like I, I was supposed to stay there for three months and she told me we need you in 20 days or something. And then I, I kind of negotiated to, to push it a bit further to like uh, mid mid September. I came to Brazil like early August and uh, and yeah, that's how I started working in Holland. So the thing is uh, mach that machine learning summer camp was mostly organized by the people from the Holland team because by the very nature of things, they were working in computer vision and where is computer vision, there is ML. And so I, I had the luck in that sense to, to be hired into, into one of the, if not the best team, in my opinion, um, at Microsoft back in the days. And kind of ironic that, you know, you had some of the first research um, in the HoloLens uh, sphere by Microsoft. And now Apple Vision is out and my Facebook's um, Oculus is out, but HoloLens is nowhere to be seen. Why yeah. do you think that happened? Oh my God, that's a long story. Like, they're, they're, Microsoft blew that opportunity so much. Like, Microsoft was so, so much ahead of everyone else back in the day that, that it's just incredible. I worked, worked on the Hollands too. I was working on the eye tracking feature of the, of the, of the project of the, of Hollands. And back then, um, that, that was just a like sci fi device and it already had hand tracking. All of the things that like Apple kind of promoted as, as we are the first ones we created to have created this, Paul and Sue already had fairly natural hand gestures. You can do like the tap gesture where you would just look at something at the hologram. And because we have also eye gaze, like you, you know exactly the eye vector, the gaze vector of a, of a person wearing the hologram. So you could just like take a look at the hologram, click, 
and select it or do something or zoom or have like 3D videos or whatnot. It was very, very good. Now, onto the question why it failed. Um, there is a lot of thinking to be had there. First of all, there was some, when I joined, there was this big offer that uh, American um, government, especially military, wanted to invest four or five billion dollars into HoloLens. And uh, that's, I think, where when the thing started kind of mixing in the, in the, in the whole, in the team, everybody started going in, um, the, the whole Serbian team kind of pulled out of the deal. Um, by the way, I'm losing you again. Do you oh, hear me? I'm, I'm not speaking anything. <laughs> yes, I hear you fine. Do you still... Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, so, so, so I was saying uh, basically um, the the whole military contract made people from Serbia to uh, we 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 kind of opted out from developing um, that branch of Holland's family, which was um, a project that was meant to be developed for military, and then the whole leadership kind of failed. Uh, there was a very unfortunate thing that ultimately happened, and that's that the guy who was leading the org got um, basically um, accused of sexual harassment, and uh, he had to leave the team. And he was there for like 10, 15 years. He was the guy who, who basically is the inventor of, of Hollands. The unfortunate fact was that at the end, the leadership kind of failed of Hollands. Uh, the, the main guy behind the project basically was uh, accused of sexual harassment and had to leave the company, even though he was the like um, the creator of HoloLens and, and Microsoft Kinect and all of these uh, devices. So it was very unfortunate. Couple that with, with um, the fact that Microsoft is really bad at doing marketing, at least historically. Now they're kind of better with the whole open AI partnership they, they're doing. But like, so, so the best researchers were incentivized to go to Google where their papers will be published, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, those companies like Google also had like higher at least from the perception standpoint, people, people deem them to be more prestigious and, and better for researchers. So kind of a combination of, of uh, brain drain, if that's the term, leadership failure um, and everything else combined. The whole military deal I mentioned that kind of made things in the org not that great because most of the org was not American based and they were very bullish on saying how we are building something for the American military and this is so great and like we are like hey but we are not in the states and 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 like not everybody is as thrilled about having about USA having better weaponry that they're later going to use on some of the countries including Serbia we were we were bombed by 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 NATO in 99 and and a lot of countries did suffer from from um some of the western countries so like not everybody is equally like uh you know what i mean um happy to, to be working on making America the great again, uh, even though like you want to contribute to the global um, scene. And, and a lot of young people and engineers and, and, and professionals are uh, like a bit more cosmopolitan than some of these higher level management folks who, who are a bit more into that whole nar narrative, America versus China, et cetera, et cetera, which I don't want to get into, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a very good point that, um, you know, politics has kind of taken over um, a lot of companies where merit and um, objective uh, reality should actually sink in. A lot of people uh, complain about um, the uh, the vogue change um, in the Silicon Valley that has uh, um, angered a lot of people. And of course, at some point um, at the expense of uh, meritocracy. And I'm just wondering, uh, Microsoft Research has some really re good research coming out of uh, um, their um, research institute. And it's kind of uh, surprising that I even though Google AI was um, always ahead of uh, everyone else, Microsoft couldn't actually develop anything coming out of their own research institute. And they finally had to buy OpenAI to actually make up for that research deficit. <laughs> um, you see that and of course ibm is nowhere to be seen now um you know it used to have a very good research department you know because we have talked about that earlier it's one of the most arrogant customer service and management um, and you know, that kind of uh, played out in their own downfall but you know now the last standing i do is uh, google and DeepMind and microsoft and open AI. how do you see this uh, rivalry or let's say how do you think that's going to play out mm. Yeah, well, Microsoft definitely had a lot of. Uh, they they made an amazing deal by by buying well buying buying a big percentage of the of the of shares in in, in OpenAI. 
Um, Microsoft historically did do amazing stuff in ML world. Like ResNet was developed in Microsoft Research Asia uh, in one of, I'm not sure which country exactly, but, um, and then the thing that happened is that uh, like all of the senior researchers that, that um, built the, the initial ResNet, which was this colossal, for, for those of you who don't know, it was like this, like very, very big, um, like, uh, like research in, in, in convolutional neural networks, they went ahead uh, to work for Google. So there, there was a lot of this uh, dynamics where best people from Microsoft were just transitioning to Google. And I think Microsoft kind of has, if you could treat Microsoft as a, like a human being with, with emotions and stuff, which it's obviously not, uh, there is a grudge, I guess, against Google. And now the whole, now that the whole dynamics happened uh, with, with, as we've seen over the over the previous uh, months, with ChatGPT and and like uh, Microsoft trying to um, improve their 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 search engine and position themselves uh, as as a better player, uh, it, it was very interesting to just uh, watch all of that from from the from the inside, so to speak. Well, quite literally, actually, because I, I was a deep mind at, at, at that at that moment. A funny issue to actually mention that, you know, I had director of data science um, at Twitter, um, Lisa Kuhn, and who's worked in uh, Microsoft for 17 years. And actually, she was one of the um, leading um, coders in VS Code um, 15 years ago. And we were talking about um, how Microsoft research um, came about and in a specific culture in Microsoft that is very elite kind of culture, you know, people coming directly from Harvard and Stanford and MIT. And, you know, it's pretty much pretty much impossible to get into um, that circle if you're not from these universities. And I think Google um, has been more open about um, you know, people welcoming people from across the board uh, if they have the talent to do so. Um, and I was just wondering, how was your experience working in DeepMind? And you know, how, how do you think um, it's, it's different from Microsoft now that you have worked for both? Um, how do you see um, the, uh, the two approaches? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the main thing I understand now is that the most important thing when you're working for a big tech is which team are you working for? That's so much more important than, than for which company do you work for? Because you could go and work for some XYZ company that's maybe not as known and do a better job in your and, and be more happy and, and learn more than working in some teams in big tech. Like, for example, at Microsoft, I had some friends who were working for SQL, uh, Azure, and they were just they were just miserable. A lot of them were super miserable uh, working, like doing the, the so-called on calls, uh, not getting additional payments for that. Actually, they did have some some small compensation, but the, the, it's definitely not worth it. And the, the, their job was mostly um, triaging, patching bugs and, and like doing some fixes, super something that's completely not creative and something that kills the young spirit and the creativity in, in young people. So and so because of the, and, and it's the same thing for Google and, and DeepMind. It really depends with whom you are working uh, and whether the, the project makes sense for for you personally. So for me, it was uh, it was definitely varying. It had it had its ups and downs. Um, can't comment on the details because of the everything, but uh, but it's definitely very important. The, the 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 five people with whom you'll be collaborating with that's the most important thing you you need to care about. Uh, when you're joining a company. And now the problem is when you're joining some of these companies, you don't really have the choice. And because of that, it's mostly pure luck. Unless you are very like high profile, very, um, um, for example, somebody who has a PhD in a specific area and you know exactly the person you'll be joining in, in which team. Uh, if, you're, if you're not in that category, if you're just joining the global pool of engineering talent, et cetera, et cetera, then you just have to be lucky. Um, and Maybe just one more thing worth mentioning, uh, Facebook, uh, now Meta, uh, they do have, at least they had historically, I'm not sure if, if something changed, they had this initial uh, boot camp where you could join and, and try a couple of different teams. And then like, I think like six, seven teams over the first month or so, and then you can decide what, what's kind of makes the most sense for you, wh where you feel inspired and what where you'll be doing the best work of your life.
I actually had Ankit on my podcast uh, from Meta, and he's uh, f- from this uh, cross uh, functional team uh, of ML who could actually work in different domains um, and you know uh, use ML to optimize uh, the process. And I think you know he had a very lucky position where he could actually you know play around with a lot of different problems. But most of the people who dream f- f- uh, at you know dream about working in fan companies, they don't realize that they don't get to you know develop something new and brag about that for the rest of their exactly. life. All they're going to do is just fix bugs uh, in one chair for a nine exactly. to five for the rest of their career. Exactly. You know, that's why it gets a lot boring. I mean, what kind of experience did you have? Like, what what was your title um, at DeepMind? Like, what was you working with? Yeah, so so uh, so at Microsoft, I was a software engineer and then later ML engineer. At DeepMind, I was a, I was a research engineer. And um, at, at DeepMind, I was basically uh, jumping, especially in the early months. I, I was just doing a bunch of stuff for, for a little bit, for like a, not, not, not that long of, of periods of time. And then at the end, over the last months, I've been basically, I was focused on, on uh, doing the uh, vision language model, the, the so-called Flamingo. Uh, I was doing the inference stuff uh, for like, like bulk inference stuff for, for Flamingo. Uh, so again, those are some 80 billion um, parameter models very very huge on that you have to run on a bunch of TPUs um, and for for me personally that was not not the the the, the, the thing I was the most excited about because it was it was very infra in nature uh, and the the thing is again you don't have really uh, that that type of flexibility to just switch like immediately unless you want to stay for many years like DeepMind definitely and all of these companies do offer you some flexibility if you want to change project but the thing is. The, the 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 time horizons and they operate on such a different time scale compared to how my mind thinks and, and what I want to accomplish in my life that I, I really I didn't have not the patience I, I didn't I didn't want to spend that many years just to join something that I I might potentially find interesting and then what happens is usually the, the grass is greener on the other other side you you come there and you notice okay it's still well it's still a huge project you're just a cog in that project maybe. If you're training like a flamingo or, or, or some of those uh, huge large language models or whatnot, you usually p- people are glorifying that as well. Like what, what usually happens is that somebody is doing the sharding part, like the low level stuff, the hardware stuff. You don't know anything about it. What you end up doing is you have some scripts for experimentation. You change a couple of hyperparameters. You run that and, and then you, you're tracking the metrics and maybe innovating a little bit. But like it's um, I, I guess most young people who join, you expect that you'll be able to do everything. And if you want that experience of doing everything, you probably should join a startup because, um, I don't know, it, it also depends. I'm, I'm kind of not being completely correct here because there are some teams that are in so-called strike modes where they uh, do everything from scratch. But uh, again, because it's, there's, especially for these bigger projects, it's usually a big, big team. And so you end up doing only a small, small part and you don't really have a necessarily a global understanding unless you're like the team lead super senior person in the team. So a bipartite question here is that um, were you dealing predominantly with uh, the vision models um, or the language models? And also, uh, were you in the um, algorithmic um, side of the equation or were you optimizing as a data engineer? Uh, a little bit of everything, but I unfortunately cannot disclose. If I, if you start digging into too much details, I might I might get into trouble with NDA and everything. But like it, it was both vision and language because the models were vision and language, and so you, you were dealing with images, with videos, with text, with all of that. So it's multi multimodal space. It was the multimodal team basically. And it was also interesting, you know, the reason I was asking if you have experience with, because a lot of your work seems to be in the vision. So I was just wondering if you're familiar with the yeah. um, the language side of things also. And one oh, of the things definitely. that I've noticed is, yeah, and one of the things that yeah, I've noticed I mean, is I, that- I did, I did, sorry for interrupting, just just maybe a quick mention here. Like I did, historically, I did actually develop a trans, original transformer paper. I implemented it from scratch and trained it actually to the, I think, original accuracy, some of the smaller checkpoints. So like I, even back then, that was, I think, in 2020, I think, I already knew exactly how transformers work, every single step of, of, the, of the whole thing. Not, not just like, hey, I read blogs or whatnot. I knew how this exactly works. I, I made it myself. I read a bunch of papers. So I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with language, definitely, as well as, as, well as vision. Historically, I, I'm more familiar with vision, but like language is definitely very close to my heart. 
Yeah, and also like your startup deals with the language models as well. So we're going to be talking about that as well. Um, but I'm, what I was getting at is that, you know, have you noticed this trend that, you know, in, since the, or maybe it's the open source power um, that the, uh, the, the power is getting out of the hands of these big companies like OpenAI and DeepMind and, you know, some other models. Uh, when you see uh, um, almost unknown entity like, uh, Technological Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi releasing the 40 billion Falcon model. Um, and it seems like, you know, everyone who has the power and expertise to do uh, language models, I mean, they can simply do that. And, you know, it. if you look at um, Hugging Face, you know, this model is on top of that. And, you know, the speeding uh, speed of inferencing um, is out of the word. And, you know, uh, you have... Uh, this model uh, out of a sudden came out of nowhere. And what do you think is, uh, how's that going to play out when, you know, it seems like it's a level playing field apart from the uh, compute power and the cost of that? I, I think it's a bit more complicated. The thing is, if you spend too much time on Twitter and because there is a there is a natural bias that open source people are much more verbal, they're much more vocal about the stuff they do. And so most of the tweets, you'll just see people open source, open source, open source, hugging face. But like, if you take the actual quantitative measures, I just today actually saw this latest um, uh, benchmark. And if you take a look at the models that are proprietary, GPT-4, GPT-3.5 Turbo from OpenAI, Anthropic Cloud model, et cetera, et cetera, they are so much better when you take a look at quantity measures compared to Falcon 40B, compared to MPT-30B from Mosaic ML, compared to all of those other models, Llama 65B or whatnot. So there is still a big gap between the best ones and 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 um, and the the open source. Um, the thing is, the the training stack and all of that is getting slowly democratized. Definitely, like there there is now Mosaic ML has amazing training um, uh, code bases, and you could and probably some of those folks from as you mentioned, is it is it Abu Dhabi by the way, or or or, or which city yeah. slash state? It, it, yeah. So like so they, they probably the just okay. They they probably just reuse some of those open source training frameworks and 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 had money to and, and and compute power to just train it. But the thing is, when you get to those like highly competitive levels, like. There is a big difference. Somebody from OpenAI and DeepMind, those guys know they are reading all of the latest research. They can implement the latest stuff and, and make stuff much more optimized, better aligned, higher performance than somebody who can just run the off-the-shelf model with a bunch of compute. I'm not, I'm not saying that's the case. That I'm, I'm, I don't have enough context of how, how good those people are um, and what their research credentials are. But like, even though they can, everybody can kind of now train these bigger models, there is still a huge gap. Between, uh, between the models. And the, the number of parameters is kind of a misleading metric because we now have also super small models, uh, even, even 1.3 billion parameters, which are, according to some uh, more subjective measures, uh, better than, than the GPT-3, uh, which came out in 2020, which was 175 billion. So that's like over 100x smaller model is, is behaving according to subjective measures better than, than those bigger ones. So, you know what I mean? Like basically the, 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 the playing field is, is very much uneven still. There, is, there are huge differences. Yeah, but if you objectively um, want to evaluate all these models, you know, so um, on the hugging face, they have uh, used the benchmark uh, across four benchmarks, you know, when you rank the models, it's still like on the top, you know, even Llama is behind that, GPT-J is behind that um, um, in the... Uh, mosaic model is uh, below that and i was just wondering uh, how is that even possible that you know you you come up with something that across the benchmark you're you're able to beat this big company without all the resources i mean i do understand you know, they have access to the latest research and you know a whole team that is dedicated um, towards making it better but you know if, if if someone out of the blue can do that you know what did it say about um the quality of the researchers um at open ai and DeepMind? Well, the, the thing is, like historically, OpenAI and DeepMind and Google Research have, have been sharing all of that knowledge with the world, and and because of that, other people can pick up, right? If they were just if they were like not sharing anything, then the 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 the, the situation would be very very much different. Also, the progress would be much much slower. One could argue, and I completely agree with that. Like open source um, is very important um, contribution to the world. It's obviously a spectrum. I, I don't think you should be 
on either extremes of the spectrum, I think we need it. And I think we need some, some nice balance of a little bit of open source, a little bit of proprietary. Those combined seem to be giving the, the most value to the humanity and are causing competition, more, more competition, which is driving more innovation. Of course, we, we do have to think about safety and everything else, um, ethics, biases, but um, that's a separate topic. I'm probably not the best person for, for those other than some hot takes. <laughs> I mean, of course, you, you you are a thought leader, of course, in this domain, and you, I'm pretty sure um, that you would have some opinions uh, about that anyway. And this is the whole purpose to bring out what you think about this. And one of the directions that um, I want to go in is um, the business viability of all this. Um, so we have given this uh, impression um, to the word that the bigger the model, the better it is, which is hilarious if you know... Um, uh, anything about ML, you know, the bigger does not always mean better. Um, and with with the ability for uh, companies um, like um, TII making Falcon model, uh, what competitive advantage uh, does these big companies have, OpenAI and DeepMind? For example, uh, OpenAI is in $540 million loss um, that um, that they're running after training um, the GPD uh, three and four models, um, and there seems to be no way to monetize that. You know, the people aren't buying twenty bucks uh, membership uh, for as much as they would like to, um, to in order to become profitable. DeepMind has been um, in um, loss for past ten years, so there there is no uh, seemingly uh, good enough. A practical business application for that and this is why you know some people might argue that you know we are ushering um, into another ai winter that was spurred by uh, the snake oil merchants of ai even back then what's your take on that Sorry, the sound quality was kind of um, very, very bad at the last couple of seconds, but I, I, I think I, I understood all of your questions. Basically, the first thing is, I think worth mentioning, uh, bigger model, like bigger, bigger is better when you're working with these models. The, 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 the reason I mentioned the small model and contrasted it with GPT-3, which was much bigger, but like way worse, is because one was published in 2020 and the other one in 2023. So that's a big difference. But if you take a look at like models right now, which have all of the same ingredients, which means we can now do equal comparisons, and one is bigger, the bigger one is going to be obviously better. And there is actually, I think there is a very nice paper from Europe's uh, 2021, if I'm not wrong, where they even have, um, they have theoretical guarantees that show that, that the more parameters you have, the smoother the the, um, the the embedding space will be basically of, of those bigger models. And thus, it's going to be better at approximating arbitrary functions you're trying to model of the world. So in that sense, bigger does mean better. And that means that by definition, uh, more resourceful companies will have, that will be the defensibility part. Like they, they, will, be, they will be able to pour more money into these projects. And, and, and that's going to be a differentiating factor. Now on to the fact whether... The whole um, LLM API business makes sense as 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 a, as a business model. Um, I don't know. Like I think you can treat of this whole LLM platform, so to speak, almost as as a, as a cloud platform. You, you you will see more and more AI apps being built on top of these platforms, same as we had software 1.0 apps uh, being built on top of cloud platforms. So if you and OpenAI is doing this successful. If you position yourself as somebody that everybody is using, all of the up and coming startups is using you, you're in a good position. Now, we do know that some companies like Jasper, for example, I think they had like higher revenue at one point of time. I'm not sure what the numbers exactly now are than, than what OpenAI had, uh, at least allegedly, like, because I, I, don't, I don't think that information is public. Uh, so, but again, like, I think uh, Sam Altman and OpenAI in general, they are taking a way, way, way longer vision here. And ultimately, if you believe that these systems will be uh, as general as what we are trying to accomplish, once you get to that stage, the first person who gets to that stage, the economical incentives are huge. You can, you can solve so many problems that we are now facing as a society if you have these super intelligence general machines that all of these 
everything now, it's more about financing the current scaling efforts and alignment research, et cetera, rather than trying to be like a profitable business uh, right now in the present. So I think that's how Sam Altman and, and OpenAI in general treats this whole thing. Like they are not at all like obsessed about the short term uh, like profits. Obviously, Microsoft owns a very big share of OpenAI, so they do have some pressures there, certainly. But I'm also sure that the deal they've made, which is, I think, to the best of my knowledge, not public, is such that OpenAI has this freedom to think way more longer term and do the, 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 the big moonshots as opposed to trying to just be a profitable uh, API business or whatnot. Well, let's uh, explore this uh, game plan that they have. So in my um, view, so there are three uh, possible ways we can go. Uh, one is that um, the language models from OpenAI that's going to be incorporated in Microsoft products, uh, which I would understand might make difference, like Copilot, uh, PowerPoint, a wonderful presentation with generative art, um, Excel file manipulation and data visualization and things like that part I understand. Same with Google AI, you know, they would use uh, Bart's model um, in their prediction services, Gmail, um, cloud services, Drive, everything else. That probably would make some profit. But on the other hand, if you are a third party person, you don't necessarily have to use Bard or GPT um, three or four. What you can do is you can simply go out and take the open source model like Lightyear AI, um, Inflection, Mosaic ML, um, you know, Falcon uh, 40 billion model, and then you can use Langchain to build services on top of that. Like if they do that, there's still no use for open AI um, and DeepMind's model for the third people. Uh, parties people like where is the game plan because if, if that's the plan in the long run that they're going to make money and you know get people to jump to their uh platforms i don't really see that playing out what mm. do you think yeah well the thing is the thing you mentioned that's why i mentioned the previous benchmark the, the thing is gpt 3.5 is so much better if we're talking about this general conversation chat-based applications is so much better than anything you can find uh currently in the open source ecosystem that's the, that's the fundamental thing. Like, unless you're doing something very specific, you're trying to repurpose um, some large model and you're trying to use it only for sentiment classification or whatnot, something that's a bit more niche, not general in, in, in its nature, then taking an open source model does make sense. But if you're trying to actually create something that, that where the natural language interface is gonna be interacting directly with humans, you, you're, still, you're still very, very much behind the, the best models that that, um, th that those uh, companies like OpenAI and DeepMind and uh, Google have, Meta, etc. So yeah, but that's kind of well, I, it's it's kind of a, a cop answer because you, you could maybe argue now, okay, that's true now, but maybe in five years or three years or whatnot, open source will be the best open source models will be general enough that we don't care, and like maybe maybe like at that point like um, OpenAI's of the world will have like super intelligence. But still, for most applications, these, these models are going to be good enough. So what then? Well, it's always like the game of cat and mouse, right? Like at that point of time, those systems will be used for something. Like you always want to use the better system, right? Ultimately, even 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 if it's maybe an overkill. Unless, well, if it's economically feasible, if, if you're not paying too much for what you're gaining. But like, I don't know. It, 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 the, 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 the main defensibility at this point of time are great teams. Uh, in a concentrated environment, working very fast, shipping stuff very fast. I think that's the main mode. Because as you said, everybody can now train LLM. Um, maybe it's going to be a, like a very big suffering. Uh, as you, pro you probably saw the Meta's uh, opt model, like the, the logbooks of all of the issues they were hitting. So like, e even though you, you, f you only see the final artifact as well, that's maybe worth mentioning. Some of the companies struggled a lot, some of them not as much. And, and so there, there is a big difference there as well. And that, that translates directly to efficiency, which translates to speed, and that's the moat. So again, all of that combined gives you the moat. You're always faster than the competition. Yeah, but this, uh, this is not where the problems for OpenAI end. And because there's one more thing um, that you're forgetting. And when I talk to leaders and CEOs um, and CDOs about um, the, the probability that they are going to wholeheartedly adopt the OpenAI model, that's where the problem comes, which is that 
um, most companies, for example, you are owner for a big bank like JP Morgan Chase or uh, Capital One, uh, and you need to train um, the chatbot uh, for customer service using OpenAI. Uh, one of the things that you have to do is that you have to turn in your own data to the model for the model to be trained on. So you have to fine tune the model before you have, that is actually any good for you. And for that, they have to turn in their own data. And no company in their right mind would turn on their sensitive data to an open source model um, for, um, uh, not open source model, uh, to, open, open AI. to open AI, because yeah. it's going to use that data and that data and their inferences uh, from the data, the embeddings are going to be available for everyone uh, in the next iteration of that model. Mm -hmm. And that alone is a huge problem. And then we have problems that is it going to be available in the cloud um, for the security reason they want and the model to be on-prem. Isn't it a way better and easier solution for them to take an open source model, fine tune uh, their own use case and put it on-prem instead of actually putting it out on um, the cloud? So that's not the only no. problem that OpenAI has. Those are all legit uh, arguments. And that's why we, we saw the 1.3 billion acquisition of Mosaic ML. They, they are literally focused precisely on that use case. Although worth mentioning, as far as I know, OpenAI does not train on, if you're using their API, they are not using your data at all to train their systems on. So again, there is always gonna be a level of trust, right? When, you, when you're dealing with corporations, you always have to have trust. If you're using AWS, you have to trust that they're not doing whatever with your data. If you're using GCP, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's, it's, it's gonna be no different with LLMs, LLM companies. So it's, as I said, I'm treating it as a new platform. And so ultimately it just depends on your risk appetite and what you're trying to do. Because for some of the use cases, it's gonna be enough for you not to have to fine tune the model. You can just use the general zero shot model or, or you can prompt it and get good enough results and that you don't, don't want to do that investment. Because it's also, it's a big investment. If you're trying to fine tune, you have to build the muscles to do that in house. You have to collect the data. Well, hopefully you already have the data, but you have to train the model, spend some money there to get the system as opposed to just like prompting something and, and, and the iteration speeds there is like order of magnitude of minutes as opposed to days or weeks when you're fine tuning. Well, it depends on, on, on the system you're, you're training, but you get my point. So it's, it's definitely a spectrum. And I agree that we'll, we're gonna see a separation of companies, more companies like Mosaic ML forming and serving uh, those use cases where you want to have um, data security, you want to uh, run stuff on-prem, you want to be able to fine-tune stuff, you want to have additional flexibility. There are many things, for example, um, something I've been uh, encountering is I want to, for example, do constraint sampling. And what it means is when you're um, using your LLM, for example, to output a JSON object instead of a, like natural text, well, and that's also natural text, but like a JSON object, like a structured output, in that case, you probably want to constrain the uh, output vocabulary that's only certain logics, only certain tokens can be sampled. And you cannot do that for, for example, with the OpenAI's API. So for that type of um, flexibility, you do have to have, again, some of these open source models, like the, 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 the stuff that Mosaic is producing. So it's gonna be multiple markets and all of those companies can coexist. They're not optimizing for the same outcome. Uh, and um, I, I do see a future where both, both directions succeed. No gap. Um, I think uh, that that that's for the market to decide. But I think they're all valid concerns that you know some companies might want to use the open source one, and they would consider it like a one-off cost of building your own model. And the other companies would rather have uh, open AI's um, APIs. Um, and as uh, pivoting from that, I think one of the uh, the most um, asked questions, a kind of a fierce battle question is like, um, who do you support uh, in the war between uh, Snowflake and Databricks? Oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I followed that, that war, to be honest. If you can give me a bit more context. I know about Databricks and the recent acquisition and everything they've been doing, but like the whole Snowflake Databricks dynamics, I'm not sure I, I, I followed that news. Okay, I mean, as you know, that both are um, platforms uh, for the analytics and uh, machine learning. And uh, within the past week, you know, they had their keynotes, uh, annual keynotes in the same week. And, you know, they brought up uh, some of the offerings um, that are at least on par with um, each other. And I was just wondering, have you had experience with uh, any of these platforms as data engineer? Uh, not really, not really, because I was, I was, um... Uh, well, first of all, I was never officially a data engineer. I was dealing with data, but for example, at Microsoft, 
uh, I, I was sometimes collecting data directly from users myself. I, 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 like, and that's one of the cool things I, I, I kind of went through. I, I know everything from data collection and labeling and writing scripts to make sure labelers are doing their job correctly all the way to training models. And uh, But like for me, mostly it, it was never about using that enterprise software because when you're a big tech, obviously you're not using Databricks, right? We, we always have proprietary tools. So may, maybe now uh, in a couple of months, I'll, I'll be seeing more of how those companies, uh, the tooling looks like. But at big tech, you always have in-house stuff. Yeah, but I mean, you never had to uh, face the startup um, issue. Then we're going to circle back uh, once there are some updates. But one of the things that I really, really like about um, your work is that uh, you don't take things on face value and you have some deeper intellectual questions. And one of the things that I was reading um, about um, your work is that you have read some of the papers that most people um, don't care about um, and that, that are of very primal nature. So you talked about in your work about Alan Turing's seminal paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, uh, which is such a fantastic paper. And you know, I, I read this paper and I think uh, the, the crux of the paper was in the beginning when he asked them uh, the million dollar question, which is that, in order to answer this question, we have to first answer um, and define what machines and think mean. And that kind of dovetails very um, nicely into now the perennial question of uh, is AI sentient? And I, I, I don't know where, where do you fall on this spectrum, but I think it's, it, it, it's, it's very similar to the question that Alan Turing asked uh, many, many years ago. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's definitely a fascinating paper. And the reason I was reading those is because I really wanted to be very educated and, and, and have a very good breadth of knowledge in, in machine learning. And because it's just one of those fundamental computer science, it's kind of how the things got started, quote unquote. Um, so, 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 yeah. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Uh, the, the sound was a bit worse again. Oh, I was just saying, have you noticed the similarity between the AI sentience debate now um, and how the original question of Ellen Turing was that, you know, in order to answer the questions about um, if machines can think, we have to define first machines and think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for the sentience part, uh, <laughs> I don't know, it, it, it becomes more of a religious thing right, rather than science, right? Like there is no way... There are no falsifiable claims. You can just state whatever you want, and there is no way for me to measure and disprove whether the machine has sen sentience or not. And ultimately, you're right. It, it ends up being the how does it feel like, right? Like it, it ends up being the imitation game. It ends up being if it um, what's what's the saying? If it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, uh, then it's probably a duck. So so I don't know. Uh, like me, because I personally know exactly how these systems are trained, like everything from distributed training using, I don't know, NVIDIA Megatrons, all the way to how the loss is computed, how the data is fed, how the gradients are being propagated, how the loss is going down. If you know that whole mechanistic system, you might be, and if you're a reductionist, you might be like uh, prone to say, hey, there is, I don't see intelligence in any particular part of the system. Hence, I conclude there is, this is not an intelligent system. But I also think that's a very, very um, dangerous mindset to be had here because there is the emergence, right? There is sometimes the, 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 the sum of the parts is bigger than all of the individual pieces. And so it might be, it might very well be that, that, that either we are not intelligent in the, in the way we think or consciously, the way we think, it might all be just hallucination or illusion, or these models are. Like, so, so because I fundamentally, if you also poke around human brain, neuroscientists don't see, like, no, there is no particular piece of the hardware or computation that happens where you can say, hey, this is where there is a little bit of consciousness, or this is where there is a little bit of intelligence. So ultimately, we, we, we don't even know how to define these, right? And then... So it's, and we don't know how to measure it. And so it becomes just this religious debate on the internet. Um, not, not saying it's, it's, it's um, not a useful one, although I think I'm, I'm much more utilitarian than on the, on the philosophical spectrum, although I do, I do value interesting conversations on those topics. I mean, one of the things that we're working with uh, one of our clients is uh, towards neuromorphic computing um, and how um, modern hardware architectures can be modeled um, after a human brain. And if, if you look at uh, human brain uh, with our prefrontal lobe and temporal lobes and occipital and parietal lobes, what it does is that you know, it connects different uh, regions um, through neuronal pathways um, and creating some kind of multimodal uh, 
processing uh, where the memory and the processing is in the same place. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, is that the, the, the future um, of brain-inspired computing uh, where we could actually have um, on the same chip uh, the memory and processing that would somehow make uh, the, the, the processing speed monumentally and the uh, orders of magnitude faster? Do you think that's going to be the mm. path um, of um, artificial in general intelligence, even though the term is really abused? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a path. It's probably not the path. I think I think there are multiple ways to achieve intelligence. I think it doesn't have to be necessarily human understandable by humans to be to be powerful intelligence. It can be this shrugoth like like alien intelligence. So that that whole neuromorphic um, um, hardware um, story is very very exciting, especially because I come from electronics background as well. Um, but like I. I definitely don't buy the idea that it's 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 necessary. Um, still, very very yeah. I think it's very exciting, but like I think that that, that the current approaches we are we are we are taking are promising. Um, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not the guy who's going to say that scale is a sufficient condition. I definitely think it's a necessary condition for general intelligence, but we'll probably see some more breakthroughs. Maybe on the hardware side with neuromorphic, as you said. Highly likely, it's going to be more on the on the software side, um, but yeah, we'll see how it pans out. If you look at the benchmarks um, that we currently have, uh, both for vision um, and um, the language models, uh, it, it's it becomes very very obvious uh, that now we are at a time in research where the the law of diminishing return return is like really, really hitting hard. Um, so every new model, there's no uh, incremental gains in, in the sense that, you know, that's monumentally better than the previous ones. Uh, compute power requirement is out of the box. Environmental costs are, um, you know, really becoming huge. And I was just wondering, do you really th think that, you know, th that's a very smart choice now that, you know, just throw in more compute power, uh, more uh, parameters, um, you know, some kind of uh, adjustment with tokenization uh, and batch sizes, and in the end, we're going to be better off? Um, what is that that we cannot do with models that we have today um, that we would be able to do with like twice more um, billion parameters? Mm -hmm. I mean, you are correct in the sense that there is a saturation going on, but like I think that's a natural phenomenon. You're going to, you're, there is ultimately like the entropy of human language does have is, is finite, right? There is some loss that you will not be able to go below because you, you've kind of captured the whole the whole structure information of the language. But like having having said that, I definitely do think that that pushing the scale uh, dimension is is uh, very important. Like the, the, the thing is, we have to be humble and we have to understand that sometimes non-obvious milestones lead to something that looks super promising. I think that the best example we have over the last couple of decades is gaming and how gaming led to development of AI. Some, something that I personally have like problems with, like, hey, they're, they're, like playing games feels like such a, such a terrible waste of time, right? Like you're optimizing for this community of people who are just instead of, I don't know, like studying or, 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 or trying to be, be, like build the next rocket company, they are playing games. And all of a sudden, that gaming space led to uh, demand for, for better GPUs. And then better GPUs eventually led us to the ImageNet moment in 2012 with AlexNet, uh, the, the convolutional neural network that happened there, and everything we've seen over the, over the past decade. So that means we had a completely nonlinear, non-obvious direction where Pushing for gaming, which looks like a bad optimization objective, in my opinion, led to AI, which is something that everybody is now benefiting from. Of course, there are, there are the security issues and stuff, but like I definitely do think this is a this is one of the good directions we should be pushing for. I also think uh, that that we need to explore other directions. That's why I said it's probably not a sufficient uh, condition, but it's a necessary one. I, I honestly think. So that's kind of my my take on the on the whole scaling uh, story. Yeah, you're correct that the um, their their costs will have to pay. Uh, ecologic, it's not like the most eco-friendly uh, thing in the world. But you also have to understand that uh, hardware is getting more efficient. And I, I I would probably disagree with you on 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 stating that that we are hitting saturating returns because there are just like different dimensions we're exploring. Of okay, maybe we kind of 
depleted the whole minimization of the tunnel in the transistor, like the, the Moore's law. But then we started doing distributed uh, settings and, and like just wiring the compute and, and increasing the bandwidth and the communication and the algorithmic innovations are happening. And so you, you, you keep on getting these like uh, S curves, not exponential curves, but then the cumulative result, it seems like we're in a huge exponential curve. So I don't know. I think it's it's a very exciting time to be to be now in the industry, and I think all of these directions make sense. Um, you, everybody just has to to decide for themselves where do they see the most the, they'll they'll have the most impact in. A part of you that is not an, an engineer and you know talking as um, a global citizen, don't you think that? Um, how AI is changing um, the social fabric um, is also um, a, a source of concern for a lot of people. So Adobe recently um, announced their Firefly uh, model and you know incorporation of AI um, if, if for generative art in the Photoshop and Lightroom and their Premiere um, applications. And uh, one of the things that we have noticed in the past is that um, the use of deep fakes, um, like Donald Trump being dragged in the roads, you know, Pentagon being attacked, you know, Pope wearing the Balenciaga jacket and things like this, you know, that's making word um, a source of um, disinformation and incorrect um, um, propaganda the whole time. And these tools are accessible to everyone. So that means the the speed at which this information is coming, um, as someone who who has uh, exposure to the word and, you know, they can see how detrimental that can be to our social fabric and a generation that's coming. Don't just sometimes feel that, you know, your, your work can um, also be um, um, a source of uh, a, a genie that is out of the bottle and now there's no yeah. way to get it back. hundred percent. But I think you subscribe to that, to that fact at the moment to start working in technology, right? Historically, with any single piece of technology, nuclear is usually used because it's just so powerful and, and, and can be used in such disastrous ways. But it's also the best source of energy currently, the cleanest way to have that amount of density of energy. And, and like and, and, and so and so there are always there, there is always two sides to the equation. Yes, you're building powerful systems, which means they, they'll be powerful in bad use cases, but also powerful in good use cases. As for deep fakes, of course, the, 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 that's already a problem. I think I saw some news a couple of days ago that some of the, uh, some celebrity was basically, her face was used in a, in a deep fake porn. And, and, and that's obviously very, very, can destroy someone's reputation and life because at, uh, un, until you kind of explain what happened, the news already propagated. People don't care about truth anymore. As long as it's clickbaity, they're just going to keep on propagating information. But it's also a societal problem. Um, but on the other hand side, those 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 models are going to make the design industry so much more better. Designers more productive. Film industry creatives like so. So there is always the 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 upsides and the and the downsides. And also, again, there is we have to always keep in mind that there are some unintuitive directions. And that the lost landscape is never convex in the sense that maybe we, because we are pushing for deep fakes now, that technological breakthrough might lead to something completely not obvious that's super useful and everybody agrees it's super useful. So because of that, I, don't, I never think it's a good idea to stop, to stop research um, un, unless it's obvious that it's 100% just bad. But I, I, I'm yet to see an example where something is just 100% bad. Yeah, some people might argue that you know how can you trust um, these big companies again once um, they have lied already uh, about how the whole idea started. You know the deception of coming from OpenAI was that it's going to stay non-profit and it took all the information from people, all the data, and trained their model on, and all of a sudden it's not for profit. Uh, for some, it, it's for profit. And at, at the time of GPT three, they did not actually release the embeddings um, uh, under the guise of security concerns, um, and that's got a lot of uh, developer uh, community um, uh, out of their wits. And you know, this, this is um, total deception. You know, use public data, and as we speak, OpenAI is being sued by many different lawsuits uh, for using unauthorized use of the data. Um, so, if a yeah, product is built that. on stolen data. How can it be used for the benefit of society? And even that is not uh, sure that it's really beneficial. Mm. 
Mm. And, and there is also the stability AI. I think those guys were the first ones to get into a lot of lawsuits by the very nature of them being more open source. So, so in a very weird way, the incentives were such that you being secretive and, pro and, and keeping everything behind the scenes, you were actually like in a better position to not be sued. So that's kind of also um, not, 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 not a nice setup in the system. Um, as for OpenAI, they, they are definitely one of those misunderstood organizations. Like I think for, for anyone who's been following the space, it was obvious that, that they became for-profit way before. I think they, they became for-profit way before GPT-3 came out, right? Like I think, I'm not sure the exact year, but it might have been already 2017 or something. So um, now, now maybe you, you could definitely say they could have done a better job of rebranding or like not being open AI, being closed AI or whatnot. People are always attacking them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it's, it's complex. Uh, all, all of this can be used for... for for good and bad, ultimately, that's kind of not the most satisfying answer, but but the 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 the, the reality never is, I guess. And also, with Stack Overflow, so once Microsoft have access to all this proprietary code and any new code that people have freely contributed, now that all all of a sudden it becomes a, a help and training data for Copilot, and Microsoft is actually charging uh, for that feature for other people to use, uh, and you know the code in the big uh, to begin with was free like uh, where how does it actually mm. make um, any ethical sense yeah well but you, you could say the same thing for humans right like uh, like if you take a look at some artist like that artist through their lives they were collecting data by what, observing historical artists and and various artistic styles and they were memorizing that in their head. So in that sense, it's not, one could be a devil's advocate, play a devil's advocate here and, and say exactly that. Like you can say, hey, humans are doing the same thing. We're ultimately like just, some people are just better at disguising the theft, right? <laughs> in a way, and also research. Research is just a bunch of people who like connect a couple of dots of, of everything that somebody else before them have done. And then they take the most of the credit. So for example, even, was it Newton who said that he was building on the on the on the shoulders of giants? I, I'm fairly sure that 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 it was not. Maybe from we are we, we tend to romanticize historical figures as well. I think I, I like to take the example of Kepler here. Like the 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 fact is that Kepler before him there was this guy I, who, whose name I don't know, which kind of also is suggestive about the thing I'm saying, who was collecting data for 30 years or something. He was like very meticulously collecting the the the, the trajectories of the planets. Uh, um, and and then Kepler came and and used that amount of data, and then he figured out some of the laws, the Kepler laws, and now we all we all know just Kepler. So that's kind of long winded way to say that humans also do very similar things, and it's not completely obvious to me. And and also you probably saw this one in Japan. It's going to be very um, country dependent. I think Japan already made it law that it's completely legal to use data anywhere from the web. And train these systems, and that's that's completely fine. So when you see that a country makes such a decision, you could obviously say dismiss them and say they are completely nuts. But you can also say if there is such a disagreement across this topic, that might be the case that the question is just very complex one, and there is no obvious answer to this question. And hopefully, I kind of managed to paint the picture why I think it's complex because it's not clear how humans and what what do humans do in the vacuum. That's the ultimate question. And so why, why is it different with neural nets? Yeah, let's expand this to the global level where we're not only talking about some companies and rights of one uh, set of countries, users um, and their uh, obligations. Um, China is not far behind. And, you know, they're um, Baidu and Tencent is uh, working on their own versions of chatbots like Ernie Bot. Um, and one of the problems... Uh, with all this, like um, U.S. is a great force of destruction uh, for some reason for a long time now um, through its wars and now its uh, restriction of uh, GPUs uh, to China. Um, and NVIDIA is really sick uh, of this policy. And, you know, Jensen has um, talked about um, how this is uh, permanently uh, losing an opportunity to work with China. Um, and I was just wondering, how do you actually see as the source of political power and leverage um, and how is that going to play um, out? Uh, if not only between China and U.S., but also uh, the other significant powers um, like Russia um, and India uh, and Brazil. Uh, do you yeah. think that AI could be a decisive uh, factor and, and predictor of long-term peace or, or war? 
Oh, 100%. I mean, it's the most powerful. If we manage to create a super intelligence, that's going to be the most powerful weaponry system as well we've ever developed. So it makes completely sense to, to be very cautious and, and to closely follow what's going on. Like, as to your question about America, NVIDIA, and all of that, I think I understand all of their perspectives. If you put yourself into their shoes, NVIDIA's goal as a, as a for-profit corporation, it makes complete sense for them to want to, 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 to cooperate with China because a huge amount of revenue could be coming there, right? And so if you were to just let the companies who are for-profit optimize without any intervention, intervention from the government, you might end up with situations where they are not doing something that's the best for national security. And so even, even though before I was bashing states, like in, in a way of, of saying that they are very uh, obsessed about being the best in the world and against China or whatnot, I can still understand their perspective, right? Like, and understand why they would want to impose such restrictions on NVIDIA. Because from their perspective, they are, they are in this competition with, with China and they're trying to pull all of the leverages they have to, to, to slow them down. Now, is it fair? Well, one will probably could argue it's not fair, right? Because it should be free market. People should be able to compete. But then, like, we are not in a purely capitalistic society. There is, there is always the intervention of government the regulations, and, and it's a delicate system. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's to be seen how, how this whole thing involves. I just hope that, that people are, that we are smart and mature enough as a civilization that, that we, we don't go to our self destruction. Uh, because that would be super stupid. Um, but I don't know. Uh, one of the things um, that is not happening in China and US and Russia and in your own backyard um, in Europe, um, and I wanted to take your um, take on this one as well, which is the e EU AI Act that they recently passed and is going to be um, in full-fledged throttle uh, by the next year. Um, and they have made different categories um, of startups that are dealing with AI. I have to declare themselves that if their AI is high risk or medium risk or low risk, and you know that there are some punishments associated with that with fines and um, things like this to curb the privacy and rights of um, European consumers. And this has always been the case that you know, EU has been regulating um, the tech um, in a responsible way that's coming out of the US um, and other places around the world um, and give some kind of structured um, and semblance of uh, productivity. Um, and, and, and the reactions are mixed, uh, to say the least. Uh, people in the US absolutely um, hate that. Um, and uh, how they do with that is that, you know, they think of it as the curbing of innovation, uh, while the European counterpart um, are very concerned about <laughs> the rights and freedoms um, of the citizens. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, where do you rank on this spectrum? Oof. I, I think my hot take is that over the past decades, Europe has not been innovating nowhere as close as, 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 as the states. And, and so... I, I kind of feel we are trying to position ourselves like the world leaders in the regulation. And so it's, it feels if Europe could be, and Europe, if Europe and America could be like a pers personalities, Europe would currently probably be a boomer, like quote unquote. And, and like an American, especially SF, would be like a teenager who is who's just, I want to change the world. I want to do stuff. I want to build stuff. I don't want to be regulated. The, the, the truth is we, we have to be somewhere on the spectrum, but I think, I think like so far, Europe definitely tends to be pushing it too much with regulations, whereas the States is maybe a bit too reckless historically. So we're kind of seeing those polar opposites. Hopefully we find some common dialogue. But now the, the problem is you, you didn't mention China in this, this whole story. And I, here I am talking about China. Uh, so the, the, the problem here is it's the, it's the tragedy. It's similar to tragedy of the commons. It's, un, unless we all agree on roughly how much we want to regulate ourselves, we'll lose the, the, the competition. So if you over-regulate your own market and China is playing along some different rules, then what chance do you stand in, in 10, 15 years if they keep on innovating and collecting data and having uh, like way less like constraints compared to the Western world? So you have to take that into balance as well, right? Like there, there is the inherent, you have some inherent understanding of the risk and the potential issues and risk, like biases, etc. But you also have to take other players into the whole perspective before you make a decision. And um, I, I definitely think that Europe with this AI Act, and by the way, I'm definitely not 
um, I, not well informed on this topic enough to, to comment too much on it. But as far as I heard from interpretations of people whom I trust, I see like Paul Graham, for example, tweeted, if you're like a startup founder who is just starting an AI startup, probably a good time to move out of Europe. And so <laughs> when Paul Graham says, says, says something like that, um, well, I don't ever over-index 100%, but, but it's definitely a, a strong signal that something is way off compared to the rest of the world. I mean, in all fairness, DeepMind did originate from the UK um, and the research um, backing and uh, the quality of research coming out of um, Europe is like um, at, at par with at least um, the US. Um, I think w where the discrepancy lies um, is probably the funding um, and the openness um, of um, the adoption of the ideas um, and then, you know, subsequent uh, governmental uh, infrastructure support to these yeah. companies. I don't know if you're familiar with um, Nathan Benai. He publishes a state of the AI report yeah. um, every year. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he, he's of the opinion that, you know, Europe is going to shoot itself in, in the feed by all this um, extra regulation, even before they have achieved um, something of yep. significance. And also, if you look at uh, from the business pers perspective, um, the the corporate structure that's available uh, through the LLCs and the C corps and um, the Delaware C corps, um, I think that they're very good poised um, to give the companies um, um, a head start. But how do you think you know the next uh, deep minds uh, are are going to be um, moving to um, U.S. before um, their European origins. Like, is there a straightforward path for the European companies? Like, now you are a co uh, a founder of your own company as well. Like, is there a straightforward path for you to actually uh, have uh, startups in the U.S.? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, well, there is the Stripe Atlas uh, uh, program, which uh, allows you to very easily open up a C Corp in Delaware. And that's actually one of the options I've, I've been um, uh, looking at. Um, and um, yeah, sorry, again, what was the question? Wait, is there a straightforward path um, for the European companies and researchers to actually move to US um, and you know unshackling themselves from the European regulation? Well, that, that's probably one of one of the options I just mentioned. And then, I mean, you, you can always move outside of the EU, although I, I would definitely not, not I don't want to publicly encourage people to do something like that. I, I think we need to to probably try and and have more transparent conversations with our with policymakers here in Europe. But like the thing is, that thing is kind of already, as far as I understand, it's already concluded in a way. I'm not sure if there is a reversal process for that. And so, um, yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to, I, I have some 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 thoughts i'm currently not affected because i guess mostly because i i don't even know what the concrete repercussions are going to be on my on me and my startup but like i personally am thinking of of um of uh, re, re, relocating to uh potentially sf or 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 who knows um and i've been thinking about doing that way before this whole um uh, act happened so i, I might be outlier in, in that respect i mean let's give talk about a concrete example um what happened with um chat gpt in italy um so they actually restricted the access to um chat gpt in italy regarding some uh, privacy concerns um and other issues and which was later granted mm -hmm. um, and i think e even after um the companies stem out of the us you know if they have to operate um in the eu you know, they have to still struggle with the same issues because it's a huge market but uh, that's regulated by the eu acts so for example apple they wanted to sell iphone phones um, in EU, but now they have to use USB-C. And if they don't have USB-C, they cannot sell in EU. So in, in the end, EU, one way or another way, you know, make their problem everyone else's problem. Uh, but the <laughs> problem uh, for you guys is that um, is, is a different one, which is um, the restrictive um, and um, kind of a discriminatory nature of uh, US visa regime. So open um, a Twitter account um, and talk about um, uh, um, newer IPS, talk about CAPR conferences. There would be a huge um, delude of tweets about how um, researchers have not gotten visa to go to U.S. in time for the um, conferences. <clears throat> a lot of people have been rejected for no reason. And, you know, a lot of researchers are now sick and tired of this.
On top yeah. of that, H and H one B visas are being restricted. Uh, Canada has recently opened uh, a program that they are going to give three year visa uh, to everyone who who holds H one B visa program. How do you think that is going to take away from um, the edge that U S has? Um, and you know, a lot of uh, people are actually moving out to Canada or to um, mm. China or to other places. Yeah. So for me, because I would be going there as an entrepreneur, I think the rules might be a bit different, especially if I if I get funding from from a reputable VC, top tier VC company in the States. I think um, if I'm not wrong, the visa is called O1 uh, for, for, for that type of uh, endeavor when you're like entrepreneur or distinguished individual or whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a problem. Like I, I, I did have, have colleagues now at DeepMind who couldn't go to, uh, to um, uh, Europe this year because of the visa issue. I, I luckily had a 10-year visa back at Microsoft. I, I got this uh, business slash tourist or whatnot. I'm not sure what exactly is the, the, the visa name. Uh, so so I, I, can, I can do that type of travel without an issue. But like working there, obviously, you'd have to have either H1B or, or O1, O2, whatever uh, those ni- names are. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I just saw a tweet today, somebody commenting on, on the whole immigration uh, situation uh, with states, because states is literally a product of smartest uh, people who came from abroad to America to have money, good environment, etc. And they are what made America <laughs> great. Uh, so, so um so definitely it's shooting themselves in the foot if they are making it super hard for the best individuals in the world who either have um, PhD in their field or are just distinguished individuals in, in one way or another. If you, if you put too much friction there, you're literally disadvantaging yourself. So I'm not sure how it makes sense for, from, from their perspective as well. So it's kind of, yeah, people are confused. Yeah, it's certainly not serving them well. I mean, on a funny side, you know, there was this Turkish and graduate student from a U.S. university who actually came up with a 5G patents, but he could not get the visa in the U.S. So what he did is that he went to China and worked for Huawei, and all the patents that Huawei now have for 5G come from that student who could not actually get the visa in the U.S. So they are wow. like literally shooting themselves um, in, in the feet, and there seems to be no recognition on their part that they're doing something wrong. But let's talk uh, about your startup, Ortus. Uh, very interesting one. You know, just out of deep mind, now you're working on your own startup. Um, tell us about that, and um, you know, what are your plans for that? Mm-hmm. So Ortus is currently a Chrome extension for YouTube. It basically allows you to uh, come to YouTube, so you have your usual uh, viewport. You're watching your video, and on the side there is like a small widget where that you can just type in a question about the video and you immediately get a reply that's relevant to your question. You get timestamps, where exactly is the relevant answer in the video so you can kind of cut down and save on efficiency. So, so you kind of, I like to, to use the, the computational, the computer science terms here. You go from O of one search into O of one, uh, into O of N to O of one, because initially you're trying to, when you're trying to seek information across video, you, you sometimes go through the thumbnails and try and see wh- where something is happening or whatnot. And here you just, immediately get a reply and understand what's going on. So um, that that's the that's the that was actually always the short term vision. Uh, I'm not I'm my, my end goal was never to be obviously ho- hopefully that's obvious to, to 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 be just like a Chrome extension. I do have a bigger vision. Uh, currently uh, I I'm in such a state where uh, I'll probably I, I won't comment too much on the longer vision, but like um, let, let's say I'm thinking of of potentially uh, pivoting or, or maybe a better word would be adding some additional um, directions to, to this whole uh, current uh, current uh, situation, if that makes sense. A bit abstract, but uh, d- deliberately so at this point of time. Sure, sure. I, I completely understand. You know, there's not always a one path um, forward. There are multiple paths forward. Um, and also, uh, I was just wondering, uh, the, when, you're, when you're using transcripts uh, for the videos in order to find the answers, uh, for, uh, for the question that you might have about that video. You could also build uh, the definitions uh, of the words um, that you don't know already um, being used in the video through so- uh, a concept called 
um, you know, external uh, knowledge. And then you could use Langchain to actually build it uh, from Wikipedia uh, or from Google or some, something else. And I was just yeah. wondering if that's one of the features that you plan to incorporate. Uh, well, we are already doing that. We're just not using Langchain because I implemented all of the logic custom. Like I, I made custom logic myself just because I, I really understand these systems from ground up. I really don't have to to use such frameworks. They are still not in the production ready state. So as far as I understand, Langchain just raised 10 millions. Uh, like the, the, and, and they are planning on making it more production grade and, and collaborating with early partners. Uh, but like for me, I just went ahead and, and built everything from scratch. And uh, of course, like I, I am using um, certain augment like uh, external knowledge augmentations to 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 make the uh, the answers relevant, specific, uh, precise, all all of that combined. That's very interesting. Have have you experienced uh, working uh, with Langchain? Because that has become one of the most um, popular uh, framework, um, uh, probably after ChatGPT and uh, and the tools that people have used uh, um, have built using um, Langchain. You know, it, it is really really popular among uh, a lot of startups. And I was just wondering, um, how do you see its development and growth? Hundred percent. I think it's a good, it's a great tool to just quickly prototype something. And uh, with me, like I first built uh, my systems customly on my own, and then I later actually went through the whole um, Langchain documentation, and then I found some words and, ter and terms and, and things I've completely independently actually developed myself without actually knowing it. It was just like the most obvious, efficient way to, to do it. And then I, I can now put put words on some of the parts of the system. So that, I think that was the main value for me personally from Langchain because I now have a uh, richer uh, terminology when I'm when I'm referring to, to to parts of my system in my own mind as well but yeah it's, it's definitely a powerful it, it's 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 the classic shovel business at this point of time people are trying to build AI apps they're trying to be the platform that, that people use to build the AI apps um, conceptually it's really especially if you're if you're like very technical it's 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 not a big deal but then again it's amazing amazingly big deal if you're a newcomer to the field and you're trying to quickly uh, get started with these systems and you have, you've never heard what's gradient, you don't know what's loss, you don't know what's fine tuning, you just know you have to concatenate these Lego blocks. And, and that's what, what Langchain enables you uh, like to, to be on this level of abstraction where you don't have to think about many of the details that historically ML engineers and researchers have to think about. And uh, that, that's a good thing. Like that, that's democratizing technology and that's helping us uh, build AI apps. Um, Alexei, you, um, you're very pro prolific in your writing, um, in your speaking, um, in your work. Um, you have produced so much uh, literature um, and helped um, so many people around the world. Um, and I was just wondering, apart from um, your work and life and uh, technology, like, uh, how do you look like uh, um, as an ordinary person? Like, what hobbies do you have? Like, how do you spend time with your friends and family? Uh, like, what are your aims outside uh, work? And, you know, people want to know um, you as someone um, on the street um, who has nothing to do with uh, AI. Uh, like, what is a normal Alexa look like? <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess I, I decreasingly believe in that dichotomy between work and life. For me, it's really, it might sound cliche, but I really believe that. And it's like, I'm fairly, I'm currently hyper-focused on, on just building and learning and doing all of that. Um, so, some of the things that make me a bit more like human is the fact I have a girlfriend and that that's, and I travel every now and then, and uh, I work out every day. Like actually after this podcast, I'm going to go and do some uh, like handstand routine, uh, some, some running, uh, pull up stuff like that. But other than that, really most of the hours in my day are just spent thinking um, what should I learn next? What should I build next? What, like what's going on in AI? Like I'm really hyper, hyper focused uh, and have been over the, over the past years. And that means I don't really have that much time for, for, for um, um, what would be the good word, not random, but like um, socialization that that's just like casual and, and, and even unfortunately, even with my family, I, I, I don't get to spend too much time with them. Uh, although I, I try my best to be, to be a good son and, and brother as much as I can. But like, obviously, like anyone who is trying to accomplish anything and, and push it to the, to the, to the limits, just because of the nature of the competition, you really have to be, 
obsessive and, and push very hard. And because of that, I'm making some trade-offs that ideally, if I was a multi-threaded agent, which I'm not, like I would be just living parallel lives and one would be ch chilling with my friends and one would be with my family and one would be traveling around, one would be building tech. But like, I can't do that. And currently I'm just prioritizing ruthlessly uh, building my, my, my own company and learning as much as I can. And, and it also gives me a sense of meaning. It's not like I'm doing this because I'm like um, desperate trying to, like it's just at this point, it's just who I am. I really love learning. That gives me the, the sense of like um, happiness. And, and like I, when, when I'm just not doing anything, I, I get bored very, very quickly and I, I start doing something. So, yeah. <laughs> I think you're living in Serbia, what Chinese live um, through 966 um, in China. Um, but I guess the, the most important thing in our lives is uh, not to become prisoners of uh, our own ambition. Um, and uh, meanwhile, have some semblance of uh, work-life balance. But I guess I do understand uh, the need for uh, productivity and um, you know, um, making a dent. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, uh, Alexa. Uh, it was such a wonderful conversation, um, enlightening, uh, informative, um, and insightful. Uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks a lot. This was super, super a pleasure being here. And I think two plus hours kind of flew by. So that's, uh, that's, that's a good sign, definitely. Thank you.